recovery that you can run using SNMP. So you create a SNMP profile, and then those applications that match with the SNMP profile that you're creating are uh, added to the inventory. So the steps to run the discovery is, or the steps are the following steps that you see here. First, configure the subnets where you want to run the search. Could be one subnet or multiple subnets. Specify the SNMP profile or profiles that you want to use for the discovery. Uh, specify the element types that you want to find. You know, like say, hey, I'm trying to find, let's say, CMs or uh, messaging systems or any kind of AVI applications that you're trying to find. And then finally, you schedule or run the discovery. So how you do it? So when you go to the inventory and go to manage elements, these are the two ways that I was saying. If you go to manage elements and click on new, that's a manual way to add applications to the inventory. As a matter of fact, that's how I added yesterday the dummy messaging system that I added, remember? I manually did it. And if you go to the next tab, there is this discovery tab that allows you to discover. What's going on here? And if you go to the discovery tab, then here you, you find the three things that you have to configure. First, the subnets where you want to run the discovery, the SNMP profiles that you want to configure in order to match with the SNMP profiles of the applications that you're trying to discover. And here under element type, you specify the type of applications or type of elements that you're trying to discover. I don't know why this is not working, you know, the, the clicker. Hmm. Maybe the timer is not working. Yeah, but it's actually more related to the PowerPoint, it looks like. Because not even my, my mouse was making it switch. Let's see. Bill Gates fault, were you in slideshow? <laughs> slide so, but still, it is moved. That moved? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There you there go. Ah, oh, so maybe yeah, there's just a problem with the animation. Yeah. And there are tons of animation that is wasting clicks. And that's it. I mean, this is it. There is no exercise. Now, as nice as this sound, you know, the, uh, the discovery feature, the thing is that the Avaya applications by, def by default don't have an SNMP, SNMP enabled, you know? So, I don't, I don't know, it kind of defeats the purpose because you have to go to the Avaya application, enable SNMP, and I mean, at that time, it's always quicker just to add the application manually to the inventory. Right. And sometimes, even if your application, even if your appli Avaya application already has SNMP enabled, mm -hmm. Usually, it's enabled, but it's, spec it's specifying the IP address of those applications that can access the application via SNMP. Let me actually uh, show you, for example, CM, let's say. Let's go to CM. You configure SNMP and CM via browser. Have you configured SNMP and CM? Yeah. Okay. So. Let's see how it looks in seven, release seven. This is actually student, student zero one. And maybe it's not. Ah, no, it's actually training. Here is training. Training and training one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Use, last week I used some Avaya labs. Last week I had to deliver a session for Singapore, wow. but from here, <laughs> man, it was hard. Wow. What's the time delta? It was 15 hours. 15 hours, yeah. Ah. I think it's the last time that I do that. Yeah, that had to be weird. Yeah. yeah. 
And let's see, so you configure SNMP here, you go to access, and notice that there is no SNMP communities users, okay, I'm gonna add one. And let's suppose that you're working with SNMP version three. So you configure here your SNMP version. Let's, I don't know, let's just go with something here. Like for example, let's suppose that you're providing read and write access, maybe username, let's call this, uh, what can we call it? Let's see, customer maybe. Password, password. So I'm configuring the profile right now, but I'm actually forgot about something here. Okay, hmm. yeah, I hadn't noticed that only for, for SNMP version one and two, which are the less secure versions of SNMP, mm -hmm. you need to specify the IP address of the element accessing via SNMP. I thought that for SNMP version three, you would have to specify the IP address as well, but notice that you don't. So mm -hmm. if your CMs, let's say, already have SNMP version three configured, and you know the, all of these uh, passwords, then I guess that the auto discovery feature could be useful, especially if you're trying to discover, I don't know, 20 CMs, you know, something like that. So, but if you're using in your CMs version one or version two in SNMP, notice that you need to go to CM and specify the IP address of system manager so that system are capable of discover that element, which completely defeats the purpose to me. You know, okay. it's always just quicker to go just, that, manually. just manually yeah. add the application. Okay, but the discovery feature is an option and now you know that that's why when you go to manage element, there is that discovery tab that allows you to potentially discover applications via SNMP, and those are Avaya applications. I'm going to give you part two right now. The beginning of part two is still going to be related to system <coughs> manager. So probably for the next, you already have it? Yep. And you have it yeah. too? So the beginning of part two is going to be about system manager and some extra functionality related to system manager. You got it? I got it, yeah. Oh, I have this extra box. Jesse, you got it? Did I give yes, you one? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then, uh, so so what I'm saying is that probably within the next two hours, we're still gonna work with system manager, no session manager. And then around noon, we'll start working with session manager. And from noon to Friday, it's gonna be all about session manager, integrating with CM for zip phones, for a bunch of stuff. Okay, but all related to session man. <coughs> okay. First thing that we're going to talk about is logs and alarms. So pretty much system manager is able to collect logs and alarms of all of the applications in the inventory. All of those applications that you add to the system manager inventory, you are potentially able to receive from those applications logs and alarms. In previous releases, you didn't need to do anything for that to happen. Starting with release 6.3, you need to configure something known as a service ability agent for that to happen, okay? It's, they don't mention it here in the slides, but just be aware that 
for you to be able to receive alarms and logs, let's say from CM, if you add CM to the inventory, you need to configure a serviceability agent to be able to receive those alarms, okay? If you later add session manager to system manager, as we're gonna be doing today, and you wanna receive alarms from session manager, you need to configure a serviceability agent for that purpose, okay? Just be aware of that. Uh, okay, logs can be easily inspected, searched, and downloaded, and alarms are sent over SNMP. You could receive those alarms and also forward those alarms somewhere else via SNMP traps. Logs, so there are a lot of loggers in System Manager that generate logs. A logger is just something that generates logs. Notice that they're going here to events, log settings, and they're showing you here that there are at least in this release, which is 603, 16 pages of loggers. Not logs, but loggers. I think that in release seven there are more pages. Now, you could eventually modify some things related to these loggers, like the log level, the file path where the log is stored, and some other things, but usually, you end up modifying these loggers only if Avaya tells you, tells you to do so. And they're not that intuitive, you know? Like, it's not like you go to a logger like, okay, now I can see easily that this logger is about this specific thing. It's not like that. You'll see the names, and you're gonna see that sometimes the name of the logger is kind of intuitive, like, oh, okay, I mean, clearly this logger generates these kind of logs. But most of the time, I would say, that's not the case, you know? So that's why most of the time you just end up modifying this if Avaya tells you to do so in case you're trying to troubleshoot a problem. All of those loggers generate logs that you can see here under Log Viewer. So there is actually not much you do under Log Settings, but actually you go to Log Viewer and that's where you get to see all of the logs that are being generated in System Manager, either by System Manager or by applications managed by System Manager. Okay. Both logs and alarms are located here under events. Now they're talking about alarms. They just moved to alarms. And there's very little you can do with alarms more than just try to fix them, you know, more than just try to fix the problem. With alarms, uh, you get to see the severity and status of the alarm the source of the alarm, you know, IP or host name of that source, and then a description of the alarm. And there's not much you can do more than just probably delete the alarm. If you delete the alarm and it's an active alarm, it's gonna come up again, okay? And you could export alarms, and you export them to a CSV file that you could later open up with something like Excel or in this case some of the laptops that you have right now some of them have Excel and some of them have a um, What's the name of the tool? CSV. Libre Open Office. Office. Libre Open Office. Oh. That's probably the one, the one that we're gonna be using okay. And actually there is an alarm lab For you go ahead. It's a simple lab go through it. It starts in page 11 They want you to change pretty much one of the alarms that you find over there to acknowledge. And acknowledge is just a way for you to change the status of the alarm so that if you have a team working on alarms, they know that you already acknowledge that alarm and you're probably working on it. And you're gonna notice that when you acknowledge an alarm, then the menu that right now is grayed out, clear, is gonna be available. So you acknowledge an alarm and then you're able to clear the alarm. However, when you clear the alarm, all, all, happens, all that happens is that the alarm changes the status to clear, but it's not removed from the system. It's a way for you to tell others, right, that you work on that alarm, you fix the problem, but it's still there. I mean, the, there's, some, there's an in entry for history purposes. <coughs> right. And you can always remove that alarm if you want, but it's just a way for you to tell, hey, during this week or during this month, we fixed these alarms and they're clean. 
And again, there's not much you can do with alarms, more than acknowledge them, clear them, and export them to a CSV file. And notice that in the, in the exercise, they're asking you to go to advanced search and in the criteria, look for the word present. But in these labs, <laughs> this was good for the other labs we had, because there was a present server generating alarms. But in these labs, we don't have a present server, so you're probably not gonna find anything related to present, okay? So let me just skip this. It's very basic, I mean, at the end, there's not much you can do with alarms more than export those or delete those, but it's very intuitive, okay? Let me just move on, because the alarm lab is very, very simple. Now, logs. So the log viewer is where you get to see the logs generated by the loggers. And you're gonna see tons of information when you go to the log viewer, tons of pages there. So for sure you have to filter out some stuff. And there are two ways to filter in, not only in this page, but in most of the system manner pages, mm -hmm. there are two ways to filter. One of them is by working with the filter option and the other one is an advanced search. By the way, notice that if you select the log and click on view, you get to see some uh, log details. And they're talking about filtering now here. Again, the two options is advanced search and filter. To enable the filter, option you need to click on enable and then you need to enter some text to compare in any of the chosen fields and then you need to click on apply so actually let me show it to you I mean it's very simple probably intuitive but let me show it to you with one of the systems so let's see I've been using lab one so what I'm saying is that if you go to events logs log viewer notice that there are 52 pages of logs <laughs> right now. So two options to filter stuff. One is enable. And when you click on enable, notice that now you have some fields that you could, uh, uh, where you could type some, in, some words and that's gonna be the text that's gonna be compared with the field. Uh, you have, let's see, login ID, host name, prototype, severity, that one is a drop down menu even ID, message, process name, and facility. Once you type your text there, uh, you click on apply. That's it, intuitive. The advanced search, oops, the advanced search is that other option. And this one, if you compare it with the filter option, has an extra criteria. I mean, take a look at the criteria. It has an extra criteria that the other option, the other option doesn't have, which is timestamp. And the timestamp allows you to filter based on a time range that you specify. Let's say you wanna see logs only related to, I don't know, two days ago, something like that. The way you make it work is, notice that you would say something like, hey, timestamp maybe more than or greater, greater than this specific day, and less, how you say, lesser than? Less than, less, less, than, than. less than some other day. Like for example, you could say between October 13 and October 40, something like that. You know, and you're able to change this Boolean in case you need to change it, but Pretty much what the advanced search gives you is this timestamp criteria that the other option doesn't offer. That's pretty much it. So that's pretty much what they're mentioning in this slide. And as with alarms, you're able to export logs to a CSV file that you could potentially open with Excel or OpenOffice or any other tool. Now, Let's do the exercise in page 23. It's about getting to see logs.
but what they're gonna do is they're gonna force you to generate one log by logging off and logging in with the incorrect credentials. Mm. Yeah. Okay, and then you're gonna see those logs generated by that action. So give it a try, you know if it works. Starts in page 23. And it generates two entries, right? I, I think the last time I, ch I checked, I, I realized that it generates two entries, I mean two yeah, logs. I and it's it. probably because to system matter, one log is for the wrong username and the other one for the wrong password. Wrong password yeah, yeah. Even though you may use a correct username, I, I mean maybe for system right. manager, the fact that you use the wrong password makes it think that it was also wrong. And then you see mine, but <laughs> this one the same one. <coughs> it was multiple. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. yeah, so in the future, if you ever wanna get to see only messages related to one administrator, like you, I wanna see what Alex been doing, mm -hmm. you know, so what I could do, is simply, let me see, let me see. Like I know that your ID, <laughs> actually this one is not you, but this one is you, right? Alice Don't. Well, that was one I made up to, so that it would fail. Ah, uh, that was a... Um, like I use the wrong yeah, login as well. Ah, okay, okay. I probably should have used the right login and the wrong password. I use the right login. He, he, okay. Use Alex's, because that was the right login. Yeah, so my point is that what you could do in the future, if you want to see, let's see, what Alex is doing, mm -hmm. all you need to do is go enable the, the filter, go to the messages, and type the login ID, right? Apply now the, the filter, and then you get to see all of the stuff that you've been doing pretty much and all of those logs that have been generated because, uh, because of your actions mm -hmm. in system manager. Something that's pretty nice about uh, managing CM from system manager, which we're not doing right now, but it's pretty, I mean, we will eventually, later this week, is that when you configure CM from System Manager, the logs are very detailed. Not like when you configure CM directly from ASA or PADI. You know, like for example, in CM, if I go to a station and I change the cost, or I change the code to be something else, mm -hmm. and I do a list history, yeah. you'll see only in it list history, changed. change station. But it doesn't tell you what was it It changed. doesn't tell me what was changed. Right. Here, if you do it in System Manager, it'll tell you what was changed and what was the old value and the oh, new okay. value. That's so great. when people start administering CM from System Manager, that's something that they love. You know, the fact that the logs show you very, a lot of detail, you know, a lot of detail related to the things that were done mm -hmm. in that CM. <laughs> that's good. And how far back were the logs then? Yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question and the answer is 
it depends on the amount of, uh, there is a setting where you could specify the amount of uh, space and as long as that space is completely filled up, they, for, they yeah, they start to actually overwrite, you know, the old logs. Is that set in log settings or? That's, I, man, I don't remember, that's, that's actually, let me see, no, that's probably not going to be in log settings. I've seen it, but I don't remember, that's in configurations. And I remember there is a setting, but here that oh, notice in that data retention there is this one here, which is actually removing stuff, all logs every thirty days. Not every thirty days, sorry, but a log that's thirty days old is going to yeah. be removed. But I remember I also saw a setting. I don't. That's the answer. Huh? That's the answer. Yeah, but I remember that I also saw a setting where you could specify how much uh, space in the disk you wanted to allow for logs. Let me look for it. I think, I think you can do that on... Huh? You think you found it? You can do it on reports. In, um, you set the space on reports. You set the space on reports? Maybe. Usually you set the space on everything, but it looks like... It's let me see. Logging service? Yeah, logging service. Max time in order to wait, blah, blah, blah. Directory path for harvest. Maximum size of the harvest directory, 10 gig. I think that's the one, yeah. Maximum allowed size of harvest directory, 10 gigabytes. Yeah. Under settings, session manager, logging service. Settings, uh, system manager, you said? Yep, SMGR, yep, system manager, and then uh, logging service. Logging service. Yeah, I think this is the one that I had seen before, 10 gigabytes. But, I mean, to your question, Wayne, I mean, it's actually the other one, right? Mm -hmm. It's gonna be 30 days. And it's not that every 30 so days. Up to 30 days. So up to 30 days. Right, and it could be less if uh, you hit 10 gigs. If you hit the 10 gigs, yeah. Okay. Is there That's cool. Okay, so that's all we have about logs. Question for you in page 33, I mean, very easy. Which of the following are search methods used to find specific logs? A and C. A and C, filter and advanced search. System manager as a license manager. <coughs> so system manager has an embedded WebLM and it allows you to license the Avaya applications. Pretty much starting with release six. Now we have this new application called WebLM. Are you all guys familiar with WebLM, the Web License Manager? It's just an Avaya application that allows you to license other Avaya applications. Back in the day before release six, you need to go directly to the Avaya application and install a license there. Now what you do is you install all of your licenses in this WebLM and then you go to the Avaya application and point to the IP address of the WebLM. And usually, depending on the Avaya application, uh, every now and then the application queries the WebLM server to see if there is a license. Mm -hmm. Usually it's every 10 minutes. Oh. So every 10 minutes, the Avaya application goes and checks for a license in the WebLM, WebLM server. All of the Avaya applications need a license. In release 6.3 and release 7.0, System Manager didn't need a license. Now in release 7.1, even System Manager requires a license. <laughs> you know? So Avaya is gonna require that you have it, so they're gonna require that you have to buy a license. Yeah, usually, so usually if you don't install the license, you have 30 days, you have a grace period of 30 days to install that license. And if, if you don't install the license within 30 days, then the administration blocks. And you cannot administer the application and, until you install the license. One of those applications that don't even give you the 30 days is the new Avaya or a media server. You know, which kind of sucks because it, 
uh, it doesn't open the door for you to try it and see if you like it. <laughs> yeah. Licenses are not portable, which means that, I mean, when you generate a license for your system, you need to uh, link it to the MAC address of the WebLM. So pretty much what you do is you go to your WebLM, which in System Manager is located here under licenses and you're gonna notice that only one administrator can go to this page uh, at a given time so mm -hmm. I was the first one to get it and you'll see that it's, it's blocked for you right yeah. now and if I go to the WebLM and if I go to server properties this is where I could find the MAC address of this WebLM it's a virtual MAC address, which yeah. means that if I reinstall System Manager, this is gonna change. It's not really a MAC address. Yeah, it's kind of a, vir it, yeah. It's, it has the structure of a MAC address, it's a but it's a host ID. It's exactly yeah, so it's actually mm -hmm. a host ID, but it has the same structure of a MAC address. Right. But again, if you reinstall System Manager, this is gonna change, which means that you will have to re-host your license. So usually what you do, if you want to install licenses on this WebLM, is you get this MAC address, and let me see, actually, the slides talk about the procedure. Let me, let me skip some slides here. But usually what you do is you go to your WebLM, get the primary host ID, and then go to PLDS. Have you ever gone to PLDS? Go to PLDS, and in PLDS, with the license activation code that's given to you when you buy an Avaya product, you pretty much uh, go and see what licenses are ready there for you, and you associate those licenses to the MAC address, or let's say the, the host ID that you get from WebLM. And then you generate that license and you install the license. <coughs> so license are, licenses are not portable because they're pretty much link to the MAC address or let's say the virtual host ID of that WebLM. Let me go back some slides. Here in page 38, they're talking about two ways in where you, config, you could configure your WebLM. There is one way which is known as the standard configuration model where you just have one WebLM and you install the licenses there for all of your systems. There is a new model that probably came out around four years ago, five years ago, which is the enterprise configuration, where you have one WebLM as the master WebLM and some local WebLMs that are kind of slave WebLM, and you install the license on the master WebLM and you push from the master to the local WebLMs depending on how you want to do it. This is especially useful in call center environments where normally you move agents from one call center to another call center. Mm -hmm. So instead of having to generate uh, your licenses again, which was what you had to do before, now what you end up doing is, let's suppose that you have two call centers and this, is, this local WebLM is in one of them and this other is in the other call center. So you install the license for the agents in the master WebLM. Let's say you have 4,000 agents. So you start the license for the 4,000 agents in the master WebLM, and let's suppose that 2,000 of those are here, 2,000 of those are here. So you just push those licenses to the local WebLMs, and if later 1,000 of the, those uh, agents had to relocate to the other call center, it's easier for you to reallocate those licenses because all you need to do is go to the master WebLM and say, hey, now out of those 4,000 licenses, I'm gonna push 3,000 to one place and 1,000 to the other. Is that really an application that people use regularly? It seems like that would be pretty hard. No, yeah, a lot of, a lot of customers have, have the enterprise model, especially, especially uh, when they're trying to license the AES with with staff for agents or third party applications. But yeah. I guess maybe a lot of customers complained that, you know, one office is over licensed and the other one's under licensed and they wanted to make use of the existing licenses and one that was underutilized. And now if you can do that that makes sense, yeah. 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 Not much of a cost. 
well, not moving people. Yeah. If I'm in San Fran and they say, you're going to move to New York, I'm like, see ya, you're getting right. a new job. Much less than people. But yeah, to make uh, use of all the licenses, having a centralized repository, that yeah. I could see a yeah, good I use for that. that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, maybe that's a better example than my yeah. example. Yeah. No, but <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but yeah, the truth is that you do see customers with customers with uh, this enterprise model. Another thing that's not mentioned in this slide, but it's good to know, is that by default, one WebLM can only license one CM. If you want to license multiple standalone CMs. You also need to enable something in that WebLM known as centralized licensing. Uh, because by default, you're not able to license uh, more than one communication manager per WebLM. Oh. Okay. So your system manager by default can only manage one of them? Once, yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. Unless you enable centralized licensing, which is enabled, let me see. So you have to have your, a license for your CM and then a license. Or just the fact that your system manager is licensed? You no longer have the, a license directly on CM. Oh, uh, okay. No, that was, yeah, right, yeah. Was, starting yeah. with release 6, you no yeah. longer have a license right. installed directly on CM. You actually install it on your WebLM, and then your, your CM, let me take advantage that we have CM right now open. This was training, training 1. And you go to licensing, mm -hmm. WebLM configuration, and here you specify the IP address of your WebLM. Right, so you set that up. <coughs> Every 10 minutes, when I go and look for that whatever. license. But I understand it's not licensed in CM, but it's licensed on like server in, in six. You know, it's, it's yeah, so it's, yeah. So you no longer install the license, and not only for CM, but for all of the Avaya applications, right. you no longer install the license so directly. I have a license uh, there. And then I have to have another license to manage it in um, S, uh, system manager. Yes. No. Okay. No. Just you would install a license in your system manager. Here you install a license for CM, and that's it. Then the license I was talking about for system manager itself in release seven point one is so that you can access system manager, but. That license, I don't know if that one is the one that's probably confusing you, the license for system manager. It's something new in release uh, 7.1. Right, and so if I wanted to manage a second CM, uh -huh. what do I have to do? Okay, if you want to manage a second CM, the thing is, the problem right now is that I don't even have uh, the same user ID. The thing is I would have to enable centralized um, What's the name of the feature is centralized configuration or something like that. But for you to enable it, you need to have at least one CM license, which I don't have right now. You know, that's what that's what you would need. You would need to have one CM license already installed, and in the bottom of that license, you'll have an option to enable centralized uh, WebLM or something like that. And then from there, you're able to install more licenses if you in if you end up uh, enabling the right. feature. So, so those licenses, the second license, where are they coming from? Are they from the CM or are they, or no, not the CM, the application or whatever? Or do I go back to, how do I get that second license? That's uh, exactly the same procedure. You go to PLDAs, generate your license, and and you install so the it license. Does it cost the customer more money to manage the second one? Say that again? Does it cost the customer anything to manage more than one CM? 